You've seen it on Rot TV. Now you can get your very own IBW gear. Everything from t-shirts, coffee mugs, hats, and so much more. Check out the entire selection of international big time wrestling products at rockstv.com. Get your IBW gear now. Wrestling fans, if you like what you've seen, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and also don't forget to ring that bell. Thank you for joining us. Another edition of Big Time Memories is on the air. I'm Terry Sullivan. This is Dave Drayson. And today, one of my and your all-time favorites. Oh, God. To me, the best uh, television commentator in history. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, yeah. We were so lucky in the big time uh, wrestling uh, area to have this guy. Uh, he was just class personified. He gave a legitimacy to the sport of wrestling, knew what he was talking about because he was in the ring, and he knew the guys that were, you know, that he was talking about in the ring. Right. And that would be Lord Athol Layton. And his real name is Alan Layton. Well, you know? It depends on who you talk to, and that, that's an interesting question because in, to, to me, his real name was Athol. Mm -hmm. Because I saw him introduce himself on occasion as Alan. Now, why he wouldn't want to introduce himself as Athol, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, especially if, you know, he had a lisp, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. We won't say that on the air here. Yeah. But he was born August 20th, 1921, in Surrey, United Kingdom, over in Great Britain. And he grew up in England, and he moved to Australia when he was at the age of 13, his parents uh, got up and, you know, I think this, you know, right about just before the war years in uh, Great Britain, you know, uh, and they decided to go to Australia. So at age 13, his lordship, you know, moved to, you know, the land down under. And don't, don't you think about, you know, where did he get the, the lord? Where did the that lord come from? Thing. I don't know. To be completely honest with you, I have a feeling that it came about not as the result of him being a, a rich landowner in England, but I have a feeling that it came about when he teamed up with another established wrestler who was called a lord, Lord James Blears. Right. And they formed uh, a tremendous, tremendously successful tag team combination. But I think the lord title must have come around that time. Okay, but before, you know, he, we get to the wrestling portion of uh, Lord Layton, uh, he served in the Australian Imperial Forces during World War II. Uh, and during that time, he took up boxing, and he was an amateur boxing champion uh, while he was in the service. And just, you know, before that, uh, after his high school graduation, he worked at a as a chief buyer at a large department store uh, down in Australia. But then uh, he was a nature freak, uh, no. always working out. He loved wow. hiking and biking. And on one of his biking trips uh, through the hills and mountains in Australia, he met his wife, Leah. Now, and how old was he, about 20s? He would have been 
Yeah, right about 19 or 20. Okay. You know? uh, and he married in 1942 oh. at the age of 21, and they ended up having two sons, uh, John and Chris. And through one of his wife, Leah's relatives, uh, they managed a small hotel in Orange, Australia. Um, his wife ran the hotel, and of all things, Lord Layton managed the little pub that was inside this hotel. You know, he was the bartender there. Must have and, been before he got the Lord thing. Yeah. This is well before the Lordship came <laughs> yeah. in. He was still Alan or Athol Layton yeah. at that time. But uh, there was one day, there was a local carnival came into the city of Orange. Uh, and you had a chance at one of their uh, festivities there to either wrestle or box a professional. Oh. And you could win money if you won. Oh, okay. And the promoter happened to find out, you know, because Lord Layton said, yeah, I want a box. And somebody happened to tip off the promoter that Lord Layton was a amateur boxing champion. So the promoter... You know, it was almost like a, you know, wrestling in a way, yeah. a work. They paid him 10 pounds not to hurt their, their boxing the champion. Ah, yeah. Ah. And uh, they gave him five more pounds if, you know, uh, he would win and not hurt him. So he made 15 pounds for his first boxing, you know, in a way, professional boxing match. Not too bad. And the townspeople of Orange paraded Alan uh, Layton. Let's just call him Layton. Let's forget the first name. Let's just call him Lord already. Uh, they paraded him through the town as their hero. And after that, the promoter, you know, who, you know, had, you know, this carnival act going, you know, the wrestling boxing thing, they asked Lord to, you know, join them for a two week tour. So he gave up the bartending thing, you know, told the wife and she allowed him to go on this little tour for a couple of weeks, which happened to go out and he ended up staying a month. And he tried his hand at wrestling because he was mainly a boxer. But he tried his hand at wrestling uh, while they were traveling through Malaysia and Indonesia. Oh, wow. And he ended up having his first professional wrestling match in 1949 in Singapore, of all places. 1949. Wow. And it was only a year later, uh, him, his wife, and their two sons, they moved to Canada in the year 1950. And... He, you know, looking for work there, he, um, you know, met up with Frank Tunney, and he had his first match on October 24th, 1950, in Hamilton, Ontario, versus Wee Willie Davis. Frank Tunney was the promoter, very successful promoter, who basically ran all of Ontario. Right. Uh, mainly Toronto and the Maple Leaf Gardens, but he did have the whole territory through Ontario. Yeah. And it was on November 2nd, 1950, that he made his debut uh, in Ma or Maple Leaf Gardens versus Sky High Lee. Oh, okay. And Sky a, High Lee was another oh, tall giant, one. Yeah. Because Leighton at that time, he was legit 6'6". Six, six, right. And just towered over most of his other opponents. There weren't that many wrestlers who were that big at that time, but Sky High Lee was one. That would have been quite a match to see. It would have been because Sky High Lee at the time was a baby face. Oh. And when Lord Layton started his career, he was off as a you know, hated heel. Right, yeah. He was the stuffy Englishman. And to make it really stuffy, you know, his, when he would come into the ring, he would have a butler come into oh, the ring with him right. and yeah. serve him tea before his match started. Wasn't and his name Jeeves? Didn't Blears use him too? I believe yeah. so, yeah. yeah. So Leighton would have tea before his <laughs> match even started, which, you know, hey, anything that draws heat with the fans, yeah. and well, it the she, worked. The Sheik had, his, had to say his prayers. Leighton had to have his tea. <laughs> exactly. There you go. And, you know, uh, he traveled throughout Pennsylvania, New York, all through Ontario, of course. Uh, 
And in 1952, as you mentioned, he teamed up with the famous Lord Blears, and they became the tag team champions in Chicago, which was the AWA area, and they were managed by Captain Leslie Holmes. You know, so he had the butler guy, Jeeves, you know, to serve him tea, but they yeah. had this Captain Leslie Holmes as their manager, yeah. and they became the tag team champions. And he also made appearances around that time and in the next several years. Uh, basically, I, I think he did fly-ins because it wasn't like he would go. Montreal is one of the cities. It wasn't like he would go to Montreal and work uh, a week's worth of towns around Montreal. They flew right. him in. He'd mm-hmm. work Montreal. He'd work St. Louis. He'd work Boston. So he regularly went to those three cities. Um, then he came to Detroit. His first appearance was in this area, in the Detroit area, right. was in Toledo, July 23rd, 1953. And he's still a ways from appearing in Detroit at this time. He came in with Lord Blears. It was a match for the NWA World Tag Team titles, and they won over Ronnie Etchison and Pat O'Connor at wow. the Toledo Sports Arena. Also, he, uh, L.A. and San Francisco, he and Blears were huge on the, the, the left coast, the west coast, right. San Francisco and L.A. I think they spent a year or two uh, out there. And that was pretty much the end of Leighton's traveling then. He didn't and do too much after they that. They were big time. And, you know, at the time, you know, still, you know, six years into his career, and he's still wrestling as a heel. Yeah. But when he was in L.A., he hooked up with, didn't he do a movie? He did. did a movie called The King's Thief. And if you want to buy the costume he wore, it's available on uh, eBay. I wow. believe or it was at one point in time. But there's a recurring theme in Layton's life revolving around <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> and it, the character he played in the movie The King's Thief was a, a guard. And the guard's costume was like the beef eater right. from Beef Eater's Gym, the red frilly thing. And uh, he starred in that movie with Anne Blythe, David Niven, and Edmund Purdom. And that wasn't his only foray into the movie kind of scene. Right. I mean, this he appeared in a movie, but remember on CKLW Channel 9, Bill Kennedy at the movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Didn't he fill in for him at yeah, some point in he time? Was, uh, you know, he was doing the wrestling thing at CKLW, and they right. taped the day after Cobalt, so that was meant they taped on Sundays when Bill Kennedy was doing his live bit, so Layton was already there. And, and Layton was certainly up to the task. He did a really, really good job. Didn't know that much about the movies, but he could carry off the hosting chores. And then Lord Layton became a a legitimate Canadian citizen in 1958. And he made his Detroit wrestling debut on March 31st, 1962, against Fritz von Erich. So that's like nine years after he made his debut in Toledo. Right. Until he appeared in Detroit. Yeah, and it was for the Doyle and Barnett promotion, and it was the first time... Uh, he wrestled as a babyface or a good guy. Really? Against, wow. you know, Fritz von Erich. Uh-huh. And then on April 8th, 1962, uh, it was not long after, you know, his debut here that he beat Dick the Bruiser for the United States, you know, championship title and won the belt. And you know, go ahead. Talk, well, talking about Fritz and the Bruiser, in, in the city of Detroit, I honestly think there were few men in that era who had more main events, be it Olympia or Kobo or both, because Layton appeared in both, than Lord Layton. Between Fritz von Erich, between tag teams and singles, and Dick the Bruiser. Yep. You know, he, more often than not, Layton was in that main event. Oh yeah, he Detroit. was in the main event. Yeah. yeah. And and that's and he was one of the. Not only did he work at the Olympia, you know, when he first made his debut, but he also was on the very first card that christened the opening of Cobo Arena in 1961. For Barnett and Doyle. Right. Right, yeah. And he had a gift for gab, and everybody loved his British accent. And that's when, you know, they asked him to become a television commentator. Yeah, I think the the first person that he worked for was Pedro Martinez, 
who was a wrestler himself back in the 40s and, and 50s, but had branched into promoting and was doing upstate New York, Buffalo, Rochester, uh, Schenectady, Elmira, mm -hmm. that general area. And, and for a while, he promoted Madison Square Garden as well. So he was a, he was a big-time guy in, in professional wrestling. But at this point in time, he was doing TV out of Buffalo right. and brought Leighton in as his commentator. And then Pedro also ran Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, Layton, around the early 60s, Layton started doing television for Cleveland. I'm not sure whether they used uh, Buffalo tapes with Layton in Cleveland or whether there was a separate live show done in Cleveland. That's one thing I couldn't find out. But he also, you know, did commentary uh, for Frank Tunney right. in Hamilton, Hamilton, Hamilton TV. CHCH, right. And then, it's, uh, you know, Doyle and Barnett brought him in, you know, to Detroit here and had him doing commentary on CKLW Channel 9 out of Windsor. Yeah. Well, actually, I, you know, talking about the, the Cleveland live show, there was a live show. It was on Channel 8, WJW, for a number of years. Pedro Martinez, uh, actually, they, it ran for three years, and Lord Athel Layton was on commentary there. Yeah, and he was a big, you know, tag team uh, star huge. and a star on his own. Yeah, huge you know, throughout for the Martinez. Territory. Yeah, he, he pretty much concentrated from then on, the 60s on, in upstate New York, Ohio, and Ontario wrestled, uh, you know, you talk about a who's who of professional wrestling as a tag team and a singles competitor. Doc and Mike, the Gallagher brothers, right. the Shires, Ray, Ray and Roy, Roy. Ray yeah. Stevens and Roy Shire, the Kalmakoff brothers, Ivan and Carol, uh, the Kamukas, they had a lot of matches uh, yep. around there. Duke Kamuka and Sato. Kayamuka, who later became Kinji Shibuya, right. big, big name. The Tolis brothers, of course, Fritz von Erich. They had Hindu mud matches. <laughs> I remember that. I can, only re I can only imagine what that was like to see his lordship against Fritz von Erich in a, you know, a thing of mud. That oh. must have been something. And th they held those matches throughout, as I said, Ohio, upstate New York, Michigan, and Ontario. And wouldn't you say, you know, because he did a lot of tag team wrestling and, you know, he did a lot of singles, you know, would, would you say it was like 50-50 or? I'd say really 60-40. I mean, he had a lot of success as a singles wrestler, but also a lot as a tag team partner. His most frequent tag team partner was Lord James Blear. Right. There was another guy, Ilio DePaulo, right. who was a big, big star in the New York Territory in Cleveland, Leighton tagged off and with him. Fred Atkins up in Toronto, Bobo, Bobo Brazil here and there and everywhere. And also he teamed a lot with Whipper Billy Watson. Right. And oh God, they had, you know, fa fabulous matches. You know, I can remember in the, oh, when I first started going in 1964 to Kobo, uh, some of the opponents that, you know, and, and all, almost all of his matches had to do with him doing commentary, you know, on Channel 9 for the TV matches, and somehow either doing one of the interviews or during one of the matches, you know, that the, you know, the bad guy just wouldn't let up on the enhancement talent, yeah. and Lord, you know, the Lordship would have to get off his commentary table and he'd have to, you know, go over there and, you know, give the guy a judo chop or yeah, something, which led to some of the great matches he had against, i uh, say, like Bulldog Brower, yeah. Killer Carl Cox, oh, Dr. Man. Jerry yeah. Graham, yeah. Uh, you know, Giant Baba, uh, the Mass Terror. The Bruiser. Know, uh, oh, Ooh, yeah. the Bruiser, yeah. You remember there's the famous shot of Bruiser jumping off of the ring post onto Layton, who's sitting ringside of the commentary yep. desk? Oh, man. Valentine did that, too. That's right. They both yep. <laughs> came out late and ought to move the table away from ringside. <laughs> yeah, because he got it twice there. And I remember the time he ran in on Killer Carl Cox. Uh, Cox just annihilated him, tore his suit off and all this. I think that might have coincided with the trip back to Australia. Just a conjecture on my part, though. But, yeah, Cox put him out of action for several weeks. Mm -hmm. And... I can so clearly remember on Channel 9, 
before he left, he taped a, a bunch of promos to air for his eventual return match against Carl Cox at Kobo. And uh, he was dressed in his robe, and he said, I'm coming to you from my training camp live at the Algonquin <laughs> Park near Toronto. <laughs> Uh, yeah, oh, oh. and you know, after a while, he didn't travel much uh, after the 1950s, but he did work in the AWA territory, Vern yeah. Gagne's territory. I think they must have had some kind of an arrangement with the Ontario, with Tunney, because a lot of them were appeared at one point in time all of a sudden in Minneapolis and Minnesota throughout that area and stayed there for several months. Yeah, uh, yeah, he got around, and yeah. you know he was great. Spent and, some time in Hawaii. Yeah, his wife said that was the highlight of her <laughs> lifetime. I think you know spending time with him in Hawaii because it was just beautiful. They didn't wrestle all that much, so she got a lot of time with him. Lots of sun. Yeah. You know, at that time, I think somewhere if you know you Google this or it's on the internet. Back in the 1950s, I might have the year wrong, 56 or 58, uh, wasn't there a magazine like Life or Look or something that did a McQueen's. big expose yeah. uh, with his wife and right. like a tell-all? Yeah. And God, what a great piece that it was. was. In, in McLean's magazine, and I'll tell you what, as you watch us on YouTube through Rocks TV, I'm going to put up a link to this article, okay. so you can check it out. It's really interesting. It, Leah Layton wrote the article in McLean's Magazine, April 12th, 1958. It was called, I Married a Wrestler. Very personal look at how a, a bad guy persona affected their kids' lives, and, right. and traveling, and, and, and different. It really, really good article. Yep. And like we said, you know, he wrestled all the top stars. He was known for that big judo chop. Right. And yeah. and a, a few sayings. You know, yeah. I always remember, you know, uh, you know, something be happening in the ring and it's go, "Hello, what do we have here?" <laughs> That's right. And then at the end of every, you know, TV taping, he always say, "Cheerio to you all and good, good luck. luck." Yeah. And how oh, Then he had another one too. Uh, it was his admonition to over exuberant fans who might think about getting into the ring which never turned out well for the fans <laughs> yeah. never ever but he would say fools go where angels dare to tread yes he would throw that out there every now and then just to remind the fans and, you know, in big time wrestling here, he was such a big star for many, many years. And his first championship, I remember, as a tag team in Detroit was when he teamed with Bobo Brazil. And it was in 1970 that they defeated the Texas Outlaws, you know, Dick, Dick Murdoch Mark, and Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes, right, yeah. And Bad then, you know, he, you know, besides the commentary and tag team wrestling, singles wrestling, tag team champion, uh, he also was a special guest referee yeah, many times. Yeah, he did that a lot. It needed an authoritative referee. Well, you call upon Lord Layton, the bastion of everything that is good and noble and the man who stood for what's right and all those good things in life. Man, get him in there, and he will take care of that referee's job, and there will never be any favoritism shown, never any controversy. <laughs> now you're bringing back, you know, a bad <laughs> memory for me. Oh, yeah? Because it was the time that he was the special guest referee uh, in, with the Sheik and Bobo Brazil. Uh-oh. And, you know, during the match, it was a great match up until the time Bobo, you know, got on the Sheik and it was like Lord Layton, you know, hit the mat fast, <laughs> faster than I've ever seen it before. And it was like, one, two, three. And it's like, oh, the Sheik lost. I couldn't believe it. And I was so mad. I was so mad. And in an interview uh, I, that I've said in maybe one of our shows before, the very next day, uh, I am at, C or no, Channel 50 Studios, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting, and Bobo comes out of the dressing room, <laughs> and the fans are going crazy because he's got the New belt on and stuff, right, yeah. and he's right here, like th no more than three feet away from me. And he's got that championship belt on, and the TV cameras weren't rolling just yet. And... 
I don't know what came over me, but I just exploded. And I said, Bobo, you're a thief, you're a crook, you and that Leighton, you fast counted, you know, you should be arrested, you should be put in jail. And right at that point, he looked up at me, looked me in the eye, he got out of the ring, and he goes and tells security, get that kid out of here. So security comes over and they take me and just like escort me out the door to the outside of the <laughs> TV studio. So I missed the rest of the tapings and I was there with a couple other friends who they drove. So, you know, I was waiting outside <laughs> and then George Cannon comes out and he says, oh man, the boys in the dressing room are really giving Bobo the business about what you did. <laughs> so it's like, it wasn't long after that, uh, I think it was the very next week, uh, I was good friends with Lord Layton at the time, and he came over to me, he saw me, he says, you know, you shouldn't have done that, uh, you know, uh, but you know, I understand and you're a fan and stuff. Well, at least and he didn't do it when they were taping. Yeah, that would have been embarrassing <laughs> for Bobo. <laughs> but over the years, you know, yeah. once I was a manager and stuff and, you know, going against Bobo and stuff, we'd always have a laugh about yeah. that day in yeah. the dressing room. Interesting uh, tidbit. Back in 71, he went back to Australia, went to work for Barnett, Jim Barnett, former promoter in Detroit, was, was about the tail end of world championship wrestling mm -hmm. in Australia and brought Layton in to try to pump up the houses. Mark Lewin was still around, Gary Hart was there. And uh, so Layton went back to Australia and worked there for a while. Didn't wrestle that much, a couple of notable matches against Gary Hart. But mm. when Layton left Detroit, that meant we need somebody to fill in for him on commentary. So that was the debut of Chuck Allen and Tex McKenzie as the commentators on Big Time Wrestling, and me as the ring announcer, because it took over Chuck Allen as the ring announcer. Yeah, I remember that day, because, I mean, I know you since 1967, when yep. we were both fans, and we met, and, you know, we always, you know, would see each other at shows over the years, and, you know, you always wanted to be that ring announcer, and I always wanted to be that manager. Yeah. And, you know, both of us were very lucky and very fortunate, very and lucky. thanks to the Sheik, yeah. you know, mainly, we both got to live out our dreams. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the one funny thing that I always remember when uh, Leighton, you know, did come back, uh, you know, to big time wrestling, you know, doing the commentary and stuff. It was funny to see him walk out of the dressing room and go to his announcer's table. And he had this <laughs> big blow up ring. It was like, you know, the chairs weren't that uncomfortable. No, and, I, and I, I, I was I, young. I didn't know what the hell this thing was for. <laughs> well, his lordship had some royal pains in his arse. <laughs> Hence the blow-up cushion. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that until somebody years later had to explain that to me. And it's like, you know, poor Lordy. <laughs> But, <laughs> but, uh -oh. but he was a great wrestler and stuff, and he had his final match in 1976. And he teamed with the fabulous Lou Klein against the Kelly Twins in Toronto, Ontario. 76, huh? Yep. Wow. Yeah, so he had a great career. He did. But, you know, uh, when, you know, he retired from wrestling and he really got away from the business totally, you know, just, you know, left it all behind him. Yeah. But in his retirement, he worked as a public relations director for Bacardi. <laughs> there you go, the alcohol thing. The alcohol yeah. thing again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he was a Shriner with a high ranking as Imperial Potentate. You know, oh, he was yeah. very big into the Shriners. Yeah, he did that for a long, long time. Right. Yeah. He did a lot of charity work, yeah. uh, you know, with kids and, you know, just all over Ontario. And in 1983, Ontario um, granted him the Ontario Medal for Good Citizenship. So, you know, starting in, you know, England to Australia and his citizenship in Canada, you know, he was a fabulous person to have in that country. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, not long after that, uh, he passed away from a heart attack at his home in Mississauga, Ontario, on January 18th, 1984. Now, just uh, doing the math here, he was 63. Wow. 
Wow. 63. At my age, that, that seems like pretty young. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, that's like, you know, what, 200 and something in dog years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But yeah, he had a great long career yeah. and, you know, and as custom Terry, you know, could you give the Lordship one final ring announce? Be my pleasure. What a terrific guy. One of my, one of my heroes. When I was growing up, I always wanted to be involved in wrestling some way, got interested in television, wanted to be a wrestling announcer, but I thought, well, to be a wrestling announcer, you have to be a wrestler like Lord Layton, but he was just such a, an influential person to me. He really was my hero when I was growing up. Ladies and gentlemen, from Sydney, Australia, weighing 270 pounds, Lord Athol Layton. I'm really proud to say that I'm a part of IBW. I take pride in IBW that we are a family-run company. It's a fight. It's a sport. Our IBW tradition has always mattered. You're going to see world-class professional big-time wrestling at its best. This ain't no sports entertainment. This is professional wrestling. International big-time wrestling's The Fix. Each and every week, your fix of IBW action. You want entertainment? Look no further than Rocks TV. International Big Time Wrestling! Wrestling fans, if you like what you've seen, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and also don't forget to ring that bell.